It's 9 a.m. Time for the only Garden Talk radio show in Milwaukee. Tell your friends. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is on the air. Join us and let's grow together. Coming up on the program today, it's about building your soil for a better garden tomorrow or, or next year, as well as cold frames, which you need to know in order to get them going and protecting the plants in which you're growing now to get them to last in the winter months as long as possible, as well as a representative from a local Milwaukee-based Hunger Task Force. We'll talk about what the program is, how it came to be, and who it's really benefiting. All that plus your garden questions. That all starts right now. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird, some of the realest gardeners that you'll ever know, always willing to share their knowledge, mistakes, and working to grow together. Founders of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com that contains over 1,100 garden videos to show and teach others to grow some of what they eat. Join them for the next hour as they cover practical gardening information that has worked for them and more. Now here they are. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and 106.5 in the city of Milwaukee. I'm your host, Joy Barrett. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Barrett. The Wisconsin. It's, our, it's our 60th it's show. It's our 60th show, yeah. Now, that means nothing to probably the listeners, but for us, it's, an, it's a pretty big deal. Yeah. This program is funded by the sponsors you hear on the program. If you're watching the in-studio video, the ones that, that you see during the commercial breaks and behind us on our uh, expandable boards, uh, they pay for the show. Not even, you know, Season one, there was 50% return of sponsors from last year. They make this all possible. This is something that we have to go out and get ourselves uh, for us to have this show. So 60th show, 60th hour we've been on WNOV, uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, you can also find us all 60 shows under the radio tab at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Well, it would be 59 shows. Well, 59 shows mm-hmm. until this one comes out. Uh, In-studio video and full podcast replay uh, on all of your favorite podcast providing housers, uh, iTunes, Google, Stitcher, whatever, all those things. Uh, you can find, you can get a hold of us, uh, today if you want to talk to us, uh, during the program. Uh, you can do that by the Ivy Organics 3 in 1 Plant Guard Hotline. Ivy Organic 3 in 1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects and rodents, protects duly installed plants and trees, shields prune and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe and organic. Organic. Visit Say what? more information. <laughs> visit ivyorganics.com. You can call in anytime during the show at 414 444 5250 with your question or comment if we want to hear it. Yeah, yeah. We can, you can also email us throughout the week or during the show at twvgshow at gmail.com. You can tweet us. Our Twitter handle is twvg. Uh, and or hashtag twvg. So our handle is twvgshow uh, on Twitter. There you go. So, uh, with that being said, uh, we're going to get in the program, and we're going to talk about building your soil. Now, this uh, is the lifeblood of your garden. If you don't have good soil, and we're talking about we're not growing in hydroponics or aquaponics, that's a different topic for a different day. Whether you're growing in raised beds, containers, ground, soil is, if you don't have good soil, you're not going to have good garden. Now, there are, there are other contributing factors to why your garden may not be successful with insects and diseases, but we're not covering that. We're talking about the soil. Sure. So you want to look at current issues your plants might be having. Now, if it's something like a, a bug or a pest or an insect or whatever, that's not necessarily your soil, but something like maybe your, your leaves, yellowing of the yeah, leaves. Yeah, yellowing leaves or curling leaves or purple of leaves. Like There could be a combination of those. So you need to look at that first and think, okay, if it's not environmental around the plant or something like an insect, then it could be in the soil. 90% of the problems is prob- is typically s- below soil grade is the issue to the problem. Now, there may be diseases in the soil that's causing root issues or uptake issues, blossom in rot on tomatoes, lack of calcium because the soil is not moist enough for the calcium to be picked up. But current issues, if the plant's very, very yellow, most likely it's a lack of nitrogen, and or if it's in a container, the nutrients has been leached out because of the consistent watering you have to do. So you're going to have to resupplement or add more nutrients of some sort or another into that container for the plants to uptake to grow correctly. So we're going to talk about testing your soil. Sure. If, if you have, if you're seeing a lot of issues right now, your your number one go to thing is don't call us and say, well, this is what the seven things are are happening. Get a soil test. That's right, going to that, tell you everything. It's kind of like a uh, blood test for humans. Sometimes mm-hmm. you don't know 
what's going on beneath the surface. So a soil test is definitely something that you would want to affordable. Invest. Mm-hmm. It's affordable. You want it's it's worth the cost, especially if you are somebody who wants to grow in the ground and have maybe have had success in the past, but things do change over time. And this would be recommended for ground gardening. I wouldn't say take a soil test of your containers or your raised beds because mm-hmm. you're bringing in good soil, purple cow compost, raised bed mix, whatever the case. It's already, you know that is a good mix. You're not certain of what the nutrition, nutrient value of the actual ground soil is and or the toxicities that may exist if you're starting a new garden in a new spot in your yard. Right. So... Yeah, you can definitely get a soil test. You can and, 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 and the other thing is, Holly, you can get as much information out of a soil test. Just like anything, the more money you spend on a test, the more detailed information you can get. Right. So you can get this through your local UW Extension. There's different places online you can send your soil, um, university extensions. Otherwise, you can just do, uh, you know, you go to your favorite search engine and type in how to do a soil test or how to send in for a soil test. And that way you can you can get that done. Um, another thing you can do to actually build your soil, say your soils, it seems okay, everything seems fine, but you want to build it, you want to make sure your plants are going to have proper nutrients, you can add organic material. What is what is organic material? Organic material is anything that you add to your soil that comes from the earth, Okay. pretty much, and um, is going to add nutrients to your soil. So things like coffee grounds, things like uh, leaves, your own compost, compost in general, um, any of that is organic material. You want to know where it was derived from because if you're getting, if you're, and we've talked about this, if you if you're getting compost that came from, uh, that, that chemicals was added to that material and then it's broke down based on the level of toxicity those chemicals had in the original form, they may still be very active in the co- broke down compost. 2,4-D in weed and feed is a perfect example of that. So we want to be aware of that as well. And if you're getting free compost, you want to try to figure out where that, you know, oh, definitely. where Especially that's coming from. Especially if it's coming from, like, the city yard and it's free. You don't necessarily know. Free is not always free good. Free is not always good. You don't know where they gathered that from and what if, he, if they just take it from the side of the road and break it down, you don't know what people were putting into their compost. Exactly. And if you're buying compost from Blue Mel's Purple Cow, you know there's they, they have numbers and lots, and they know where all this stuff has come from and they, the age process. They've got it very detailed down. So if you need, hey, I bought this from this, and they can track from the or, or origins of that material. So if you have a raised bed, uh, again, we, we've got the nutrients already in the bed, there's not a whole lot of, uh, you know, there shouldn't be a whole lot of deal uh, effort go into that. Now, if you're growing in the ground and you're going to start and you're ha- and you're having difficulties with weeds or soil new- uh, deficiencies and all that, it's an investment, but it well pays for itself. A raised bed, put it together. You really have no weeds to deal with. You put some mulch on it, put your plants in it, you're done. Right. So no, yeah, raised beds are definitely a great a great option, especially if you don't want to. Invest time and energy in trying to figure out what your ground soil is like, and or you have bad or you ground have bad, soil. Bad ground soil. You just have a spot in the yard that nothing grows, and you're like, hmm, I wonder why. But well, it, uh, you want to look up first. Right, you want to look up. Well, that too. But I'm saying like a nice sunny spot. Right. Um. Yeah. So raised beds are definitely an option. Another option would be something like straw bale gardening. That's another virtually weed free way to garden, where you um, you condition the bale. And then it becomes a container in itself or a raised bed. Two years max, you're going to get out of right. that. Yeah, but it's it's worth the the time and effort because it does. They do grow beautiful plants. Uh, we want to talk about containers here because people ask us, and we are asked, what do you do with a container? Do you dump the soil out at the end of the year and start fresh next year? What is the right answer? Okay, I'm going to give you two answers to this. One is the horticultural answer, which is dump the container out and start fresh each and every year. Our answer is it's based on the size of the container. Soil is not cheap. Compost is not cheap. So if it is a 1, 3, 5, 7, 10-gallon container, dump that soil out, start fresh, because you're dealing with a small mass of material. If it's 15, 30, or beyond, remove about half of the the, uh, material out of the container, top half, and then top it off with new material, new compost, new potting mix, new whatever, uh, and then grow that way. You're going to save money, and the amount of nutrients that, based on your plant, 
uh, you can add fertilizer to that uh, container, even with that added nutrients of the new material. On I would those, agree. Yeah. yeah, you definitely want to you want you want to be smart about it. So hor- horticulture answer yes is to dump it out for a smaller container that would make sense. But when you have a larger container, you want to think about that. If you have had a severe disease problem and you can identify that disease that is harbored in the soil of that container, then no matter what the size of that container is. Get rid of the soil, either put it in the compost or sprinkle it among the garden or in the yard, and start fresh. So back to back to ground gardening. Yes. Um, part of building your soil is attracting worms to your garden. Mm-hmm. And that would include things like uh, mulching, mulching with leaves that attracts seems to attract a lot of worms, adding compost so, so that the worms have something to eat. Same thing with coffee grounds or leaves. All of that is, is good. Um, another thing is to layer whatever you're adding to your soil, layer it. Don't disturb the soil. And I know we might get some uh, rotten tomatoes thrown at us for this, but don't till. Yeah, we, we've we never tilled. We've used a garden fork when the soil had to be disturbed because we're not it, – it doesn't pulverize or powderize the soil. Now, if you're dealing with very clay soil, yeah, put some compost on there. You can, one, let it set for a year, or you can mix it in to help break down the particles of the clay. Uh, but we use a garden fork, so if we need to remove roots, we're not, we can get the full structure of the root out of the soil, and or we don't kill as many worms because the worms can fall through the tines of the fork right. and not get cut up with the, t- uh, the blades of the tiller. Right. So I guess, yeah, you definitely want to make sure that you're thinking about what's, what the microbial life is below the soil. It's not like just, it's not just soil. There's things that live in there, especially worms. So if you are going to till, Worms do react to vibrations of the earth, and so what you could do is you could take your tiller wherever you're going to till, leave it run for a few minutes, and that way the worms will go deeper into the soil to avoid those vibrations. Just like when it rains, they go burrow, they burrow deeper. Now, what we've covered here, building your soil, there are, if you really want to get in, there are some definite, absolute, must-do type of things. But a lot of this, it's based on your particular situation. There is not a, here's what you have to do because the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardeners say so. You have to take evaluation of your growing situation and figure out what is best, one, for your garden, and two, for your your dollar that you're going to spend in order to create or refurbish the garden in which you are trying to grow in. Uh, we also can, uh, ro- we need to rotate the crops because trying to grow tomatoes in the same spot for 19 years, it just doesn't work because the certain, certain nutrients are retract, are, are sucked out of the soil. Right. Exactly. And other plants put it back in. Sure. So yeah, you definitely want to rotate your crops. It's also good from a plant disease standpoint as well. Like our computer, our, our computers, our cucumbers are doing terribly. But we've been planted in the same spot. Well, we've for... rotated them three foot over, but they have some above ground disease problems, right, but... Sp- uh, spider mites and, and some other right, issues. But yeah. I think it would help to move them right, as well. Right. Uh, and finally, you can grow cover crops, which are crops designed to infuse nitrogen and other nutrients into the ground, as well as you work those in, not necessarily till them, but fold them under, chop and, they and drop add, add the, as they break down. As the organic material, and they are good for the soil as well. Yeah. So just some of the ways in which you can build your soil for a better tomorrow or if you're growing next year. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about how we can extend our growing season by a device or devices called cold frames and low tunnels right after this. Got a question? Email the show at twbgshow at gmail.com. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. Bobex is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. Bobex deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. Bobex can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more, visit Bobex.com. B-O-B-B. 
www.woodmans.com. Are you short on time when it comes to grocery shopping? Yes, I'm talking to you. ShopWoodmans.com offers online shopping for store pickup or delivery on their over 60,000 plus items at Woodman's Everyday Low Prices. Or online, select a pickup or delivery time and create more time to do what you want. Leave the work to Woodman's. Also, check out the ShopWoodman's.com app. You can even make specialist requests like specific sizes of produce. For more information, visit shopwoodmans.com. Zaz Products, offering great quality supplements that can help personal health and increase longevity. Committed to bringing you the highest quality products at the lowest price. Find out more at zazproducts.com. The Gardener's Hollow Leg, the debris and harvesting bag you wear, comes with its own belt attachment, perfect for doing light pruning, weeding, harvesting on the ground or on a ladder, and many other uses. Find out more at thegardenershollowleg.com. Save 10% by using the word veggies at checkout. Are you a cabbage head? I hope not. This garden fun fact is sponsored by ManureTea.com. Get your three-pack today. Drop the tea bag in water. Let's steep, then feed your soil, not your plant. 100% organic. Find out more at ManureTea.com. Always free shipping. Cabbage is one of the oldest vegetables dating back to the 1600s. Drinking juiced cabbage is known to assist in curing stomach and intestinal ulcers. A thick-witted person may be called a cabbage head. In the Hebrew terms, that is Rosh Karvu, cabbage head implying stupidity. Tall Earth Wood Treatment All-in-One Preservative and Stain offers lifetime protection and creates a unique silver-aged wood finish. All ingredients are non-toxic, eco-friendly, perfect for garden beds and veg trunk. Find out more at tallearth.com. Free shipping on all orders. Use coupon code W-I-S-C-O-N-V-E-G to save 15% off orders placed at tallearth.com. Do you enjoy hanging baskets but struggle to keep them properly watered? The Plant Booster Self-Watering System is a mechanical system that will ensure optimal soil moisture at all times by reacting to the weight of each plant. The weight of each plant tells the system how much water it needs. Unlike a timer-controlled system where all plants get water at the same time, whether they need it or not. Also ideal for condos or apartments with no outdoor water source. Check out details, videos, and extensive explanation and ideas for application at plantbooster.net. Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is brought to you by the following. Handy Safety Knife, BioSafe, Tall Earth, Chapin International, The Plant Booster, Ivy Organics, Woodman's Market, Blue Mills Landscaping Garden Center, Purple Cow Organics, Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, where 100% of the listeners polled prefer to hear Joey and Howie rather than an angry goat. Well, that's the. Uh, if, if you disagree with that, we'd sure like to hear from you. Uh, but only today. Only today. Yep. Uh, so cold frames are a device in which we can create, purchase, manufacture in our own backyards to extend the growing season of current crops and or plants in which we are starting now, not in October or November. Let's First of all, what is a cold frame, Holly, and what do we need to know about it if we're going to make one? Sure. So within this cold frame realm, I'm also going to... Um, include low tunnels because low tunnels are like the low maintenance version of cold frames. So cold frame or low tunnel is something that is, houses, um, you put around your, your garden, around some crops. Would you mi- say it's a mini greenhouse? Yeah, it's kind of like a mini greenhouse. Okay. And you put it around your crops or you plant crops within that area and it extends your season. So Basically, you can grow year-round some things with that cold frame or that low tunnel, uh, and you can extend your season into the fall, later into the fall or winter, or start it sooner into the spring. Okay. So it's basically, it can be made with um, plastic. It's like, we just bought drip cloth plastic from mm-hmm. the, the Six home. Six mil. The home, yeah, six mil. It's, it's a milky, um, it's not going to be see-through like glass. It's a milky film right, on it's it. Not, yeah, it's not completely um, transparent. So... 
And you can do anything from like putting straw bales around a perimeter of something and making sure it's kind of sealed off and putting old windows on top. Or you can build a cold frame as we did with some old wood and an old screened in window. Mm-hmm. And then we add it, we put, we attach that, that plastic. Or you can do something like a low tunnel where you take hoops, small hoops, whatever you have. You could use like old fence poles or whatever and then you drape the, the plastic over that and then make sure it's anchored down. So whichever device in which we choose to put over one, the crops in which we have started or starting or have been growing, we need to make sure that on warm, on cool days, let's say it's 65 degrees outside, because of convection, it could be 85, 90, or 100 plus degrees in this cold, in this low tunnel, this cold frame, which will kill the plants in which you're growing. Now, in the winter months, November, December, January, when it's 15 or 10 degrees outside, the internal temperature of that cold frame, because of the convection of the sun and the heat, radiation, all that, maybe 50 or 60, which is perfect. But we want to keep aware of what it currently is now. So now, if you for each layer of cold frame or plastic or whatever, you you extend your growing season or you move your your um, growing zone growing zone down one point five or up 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 one point five zones. So right now we're in about zone five. Mm-hmm. So if you add one layer, that puts us to six point five, which is typically like southern Illinois. Southern Illinois. Okay. Mm-hmm. So if we did a small tunnel. And then over top of that small tunnel, we had two or th- uh, a foot or so gap, and we created another tunnel on top of that. Now we have two layers of protection. Now over- we're in zone eight. We're in zone eight, which is northern Mississippi, yeah. somewhere in that area. So uh, again, but if it's winter, you're so you're experiencing like winter in northern Mississippi, right. which is like kind of like spring, I would say for us. Right. So what do we want to know about what we're putting or what we're covering? What plants can we grow? How do we grow them? to get the longevity out of them that we are putting in this cold frame. Okay, so you're certainly not growing tomatoes, like anything right. that's tropical, typically like a tomato, pepper. The, the summer, summer crops we're the, not doing. Yeah, the super summer crops, you're not going to be doing that. But the fall the fall crops, so things like, or spring crops, so things like lettuce, you can even do carrots, radishes. A lot of your um, greens. A lot of your greens. All of those are definitely able for you to grow microgreens, all of that good stuff, because... Um, they are a little bit more cold hardy and a little bit more tolerant, especially of the, the cold soil below, and it allows for uh, proper growing. Now, if you want to go and find out the precise uh, details, uh, you go to your favorite search engine and look up Nikki Jabor or look up the year-round vegetable gardener. She does this in Nova Scotia, Canada, cold frames year-round. We've had her on the program as a guest this year and last year. Um, so when do we want to... Uh, get these crops growing, or if we have crops already, what do we want to do? You can start uh, basically right now. Okay. Not, like radishes, not right now because it'll only take like 30 days, but probably within the next month you could get those started. Well, yeah, um, radishes you will start in September by October. You've got them harvested. You can start another crop in October and have them November harvest there. But you have to think about when your first frost or freeze is going to be. So frost is mid-October, so you would want to do a lot of these things like mid-September. Our first frost is mid-October. Our first freeze, flip a coin, uh, when that might be. So if we put kale in the ground, if we put um, in a green, a greens in the ground, uh, kale and cabbage, that type of thing, broccoli, cauliflower, we want to, re- we want to keep in mind that as these plants grow, they're going to get taller. So we can't make a cold frame that's 7 inches tall when these plants may get 24 or 28 inches tall. We don't want these plants to rub up against the plastic or the top of the lid of the device in which we are creating Mm -hmm. because that will absorb the coldness and actually kill that portion of the plant during the cold months that we're trying to uh, get the longevity out of it. A perfect example of this type of system in which we're speaking about, um, there is a individual that is out of the Chicago area. He's got a YouTube channel. It's called One Yard Revolution, and he is a vegetarian. And him and his wife, they grow year-round in a essentially a, a walk-in grow, uh, cold frame with other cold frames inside of that cold frame to get that double protection, which we were speaking about. Um, so it, it's a, a very, he's got it down to a science that he understands this, this mechanism of a cold frame. 
Now, a, coal, a, a low tunnel is the same thing. Now, since we're in this aspect of protection of plants, let's talk about what frost cloths are because people may hear that and think, oh, I'll just use a frost cloth to make a dome and I can grow into the winter months without any issue. Right, so frost cloth is, is different. It's typically, it's <clears throat> it's more porous um, is what it is. So it's it's it doesn't have that non-porous quality as plastic does so if it's you, a webbed mesh yes yeah, like a web mesh yeah, right yeah. so you want something like plastic definitely um because that's going to help keep that warmth in a frost cloth is designed to protect uh your cooler weather crops later in the fall if they fro- if, when it frosts or freezes if it freezes at 32 degrees this frost cloth is laid on top of the crops or draped over top of the crops and it protects the crops so they don't freeze and it has a 6 or 7 or 10 degree protection over the crops so now the crops are not going yeah. to freeze until 23 or 24 degrees instead of 32 like we're accustomed it's to kind of like when you throw your sweater on to run to the car in the middle of winter you're not spending a lot of time outside but it's a little protection um, it's going to make you a little bit more comfortable. Something like um, using that plastic is going to be like wearing your actual winter jacket where it's going to keep you nice and warm. Now, if we've already got crops growing in the ground and we're going to cover them, we're kind of limited on uh, where we can put this cold frame. We've got to put it over top of the crops in which we're growing. Yes, yeah, so you kind of have to plan ahead, and that's definitely while we're talking about this. If we're going to plant this weekend to plan ahead to put cold frames over what we're going to plant, where do we want to plant these crops at, Holly? Sure. So you want to find the sunniest spot in your yard, and you're like, well, that's where my tomatoes are right now. But <laughs> maybe maybe you can you can find another sunny Marshall spot. Partial shade now. Yeah. A yeah. lot of these crops in which we're growing will handle partial shade, and uh, they will, um, as the, as the leaves fall off, they're going to be you know more exposed to the sun. And you want the device in which you're planting in to face more southerly if you can. Uh, we talked. I had a question a couple of weeks ago about the slant on a cold frame. If we can create one, we want to slant it towards the southern sky as the hemisphere, as we change from winter to, to fall to, to uh, summer, spring, right. winter, fall, that the axis changes in where we're at in the nor- northern hemisphere. Right, yeah. So that's, that's what <clears throat> the winter solstice is, is because of how the axis, the earth is on the axis and the shifts, and that's why we go from that solstice happens, the winter solstice, and same thing with summer solstice. But either way, you do want to be aware. You you don't definitely don't want to keep it into a shady spot. Now, the other thing is, is that even though we have um, shadier spots now, in a few months, you know, fall is going to happen, so you'll have more sun in that shadier spot. So you can think about that too. Let's talk about cost. What are we looking at cost? You the cost is kind of a, a build your own adventure. There, um, you definitely want the plastic. That's going to be a cost. It's it's not terribly expensive. No. It's kind of like what we talked about in the first segment uh, with building your soil. However, you can go very limited, or you can spend a lot of money based on how large of cold frame or greenhouse or whatever you want to put over your crop. Right, and you can definitely look for windows, old windows on the side of the street and all that good stuff. So when we come back, uh, we're going to talk with Representative Amy from Milwaukee's own Hunger Task Force. We're going to ask her what the company is or what the organization is and how it is actually benefiting the community right after this. Use Twitter to reach Joey and Holly at TWVG Show or hashtag TWVG. Beans and Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh used carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff catering available open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 and online at beansandbarley.com. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from Plant Success Organics.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponic root cutting, seed sprouting, cocoa core, and soil. Plant Success Organics.com carries powder, granule, and tablet form of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil.
soil to give your plant the optimal opportunity to produce incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit PlantSuccessOrganics.com. Shield and Seal Vacuum Sealers and the highest quality vacuum sealing products. Unique black and clear and all black bags protecting your produce and product better than traditional bags. Find out more at ShieldAndSeal.com. Rebel Green, responsibly made natural products that are good for you and the environment. Made in the USA, plant-based, vegan, and always toxic-free. Find out more at rebelgreen.com. Use coupon code WIVEG15 to save 15% off your next purchase at rebelgreen.com forward slash shop. Root Assassin, a garden tool that does all the root functions with its advanced shovel that has serrated edges on both sides. Find out more information at RootAssassinShovel.com. The Handy Safety Knife is a patented, high-quality knife that's worn like a ring, so it's always conveniently at hand and very easy and efficient to work with. That's why you'll find the Handy Safety Knife at work in a wide range of industries and applications. Learn more at HandySafetyKnife.com. Place an order for your business hall toll-free, 866-294-3424. Use coupon code WVG to get 10% off and free shipping one-time use only at HandySafetyKnife.com. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Flame Engineering, Eco Garden Systems, Bob X, Plant Success, Beans and Barley, MI Gardener, Outpost Natural Food Co-op, Root Assassin, Manure Tea, The Gardener's Hollow Leg. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your host, Joey and Holly Baird. It's the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. We're so happy that you've joined us today. You know, today is a very special day for Blue Mills, uh, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Holly. We're going to be out there uh, uh, this Saturday and next Saturday from 9 to 1. Well, obviously, we're not going to be there at 9 today. Well, but, but <laughs> we'll for next Saturday, there, yeah. you'll know that you can be there from 9 to 1. They're having a little farmer's market, um, garden market, summer market. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to produce, food, music, uh, all sorts of good stuff. Maybe like crafty stuff, you know, markety stuff. Uh, you don't have to go there in the in- with the intentions of purchasing something. You can just go and talk to the vendors, talk to the craft people, talk to us. Uh, summer market, Saturday, today, the 18th of August, and next Saturday, the 25th of August, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., uh, we'll be there probably about 10.30. We'll have a little booth set up. You'll see us. It's not going to be hard to, to find us with all our banners and stuff on the table. Uh, at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield, just off of Layton. Uh, you can find more information out about them at bluemills.com. Or you can call 414-282-4220. Well, Holly, let's go to the IB Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline and bring in our next guest. Sure. Hunger Task Force is Milwaukee's free and local food bank in Wisconsin's leading anti-hunger organization. They were founded in 1974 by a group of parental advocates who are fighting for a school breakfast program through Milwaukee Public School System. Hunger Task Force provides a safety net of emergency food to a network of local food pantries and meal programs. Now, Amy Walner has started as a farm volunteer coordinator at the farm in March of 2014. Since February of the following year, she has a lead role in designing and implementing the Hunger Task Force Farm Annual Crop Plan. And she's responsible for farm op- operation improvements, visioning for the farm's multi-year sustainability plan, and equipment upgrades. Welcome to the program, Amy. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I know you're at a farmer's market to, to enlighten us about this program, this organization that maybe some peop- some of our listeners have no I- idea what it really is. They just see the sign as they go out down the interstate. Sure. Well, like you mentioned in your intro, Hunger Task Force is Milwaukee's free and local food bank. Um, we've been operating as a food bank for a number of years. So, um, oh. so as a food bank, we're providing non-perishable food to a number of sites all year round. Um, and then w- in 2012, we added the, the farm to our um, wheelhouse of what we're doing and how we're obtaining food. Well, let, let's talk about the, the addition to the farm. Now, this farm is in Franklin. Some people probably didn't know that this existed. Tell us more about the farm, what goes on, what is grown there, and how many acres. This is not just a little backyard plot in an urban setting. You've got a substantial farm that, that you're growing as much produce as on as possible. Correct. So the entire property is 208 acres. It's actually owned by Milwaukee County, and Hunger Task Force leases 
the property from Milwaukee County. Um, of the 200 acres, about 100 of that is tillable farmland. The other 100 is in natural areas, which we're also managing. Um, of the 100 tillable acres, we have about 60 that we do in annual fruits and vegetables. And then the remaining 35 to 40 acres we have in cover crop to try to continuously build the soil for future future vegetable crops. Um, as far as what we grow, we grow a wide variety of things, um, including broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, beans, sweet corn, tomatoes, peppers, lettuce, collard greens, mustard greens, watermelon, cantaloupe. So we're trying to grow a diversity of, of things um, so that our harvest is a, is a diverse mix of things. And then we also have 12 acres of apple and pear orchards of various ages that we're probably going to be start harvesting in the next couple of weeks. Um, so that's kind of just a brief lay of the land. Um, the farm has nine full-time staff, um, and we are, our main labor force is made up of about 5,000 community volunteers from the greater Milwaukee area. Um, another big part of what the farm does is we have a nutrition education program. Um, Hunger Task Force has a dietitian on staff that works with Milwaukee public school students in the classroom during the school year, um, helping kids learn about healthy eating and develop healthy eating skills and healthy habits for the, for life. And then during the spring, summer, and fall, those same students come out to the farm um, and have field trips at the farm where they um, take care of a garden, they get to know some of the natural areas of the farm, and then they also do cooking demonstrations in our, or they prepare snacks and meals in our cooking demonstration kitchen. So with the farm here, one, who is eligible to receive this food from the Hunger Task Force? And two, the, the food that is harvested from the farm, where does that go and get distributed compared to what some of us may be aware of, donate uh, canned goods to the local Hunger, or to, to Hunger Task Force and they'll distribute it among those who are in need? How do, how does, how do you balance the, the non-perishables with the perishable items that you're harvesting from the farm? That's a great question. So, um, so we do have our own fleet of trucks. Um, so uh, since we were first and foremost a food bank, we have this really robust infrastructure to be able to do our own direct distribution. So all farm fresh produce um, leaves the farm within 24 to 48 hours of harvest. So it's going to be as fresh as you can find, a lot of times much more fresh than what you would find at a grocery store. Um, so during the growing season, our distribution of fresh produce rolls right into that uh uh, normal distribution of non-perishable items. So the truck will come to the farm early in the morning and then it'll go back to the warehouse and all the produce will be distributed amongst all the trucks that are going out for delivery that day. Um, so we do our best to try to get it out as quickly as possible. Uh, sites that, so Hunger Task Force supports a network of, uh, last year, actually in 2017, it was over 341 service points. Um, that includes food pantries, um, summer meal programs, um, soup kitchens and shelters, and then um, sites that serve low-income seniors. Um, so we have right now around 50 food pantries that are in our network, and they receive regular deliveries of non-perishable as well as fresh produce. And then the senior sites also receive regular um, um, deliveries of fresh produce from the farm. Those sites become a part of our network. Um, a lot of them have been with us for a long time. Um, sometimes the number fluctuates a little bit because we do ask sites to make sure that they're upholding some of our standards and serving people um, with dignity, making sure that we have, um, that they're open for a certain number of hours a week. So we're always striving to have the best access for folks that we can. Great. Now, um, how many pounds of food would you say is given away each each year? The farm grows right around half a million pounds of fresh produce each year, and all of that is delivered completely free of charge. As a whole, I just looked at last month's stats were just under 6 million pounds of food distributed by Hunger Task Force as of July of this year. That, that's amazing. Uh, with, with all the networks, the food banks in your network, what if there is a, a food bank that, wants to get into your network, do they just contact the main office and say, hey, here's who I am, here's my credentials, can we talk about what we can do to, to work something out? Or how does, how does a, a new uh, in, a group get into that 
uh, distribution cycle. Yeah, what, exactly what you mentioned would be a great first step is getting a, getting a hold of Hunger Task Force um, so that we can see what um, the site's currently offering and how we can help um, because we do provide our sites with other things beyond just food. Um, we provide them with IT equipment. If they need things like coolers or freezers, we can help them obtain some of those things. We provide training if they have staff or volunteers um, that need some training and we can also help them access grant funding to help run their programs. So, so by all means, I, I would encourage anybody in that position to reach out and we'll see, see what we can do to help. So if people don't want to possibly donate uh, food, they can donate their time, right? The farm at the facility, um, sorting and, and uh, processing the, what has come in in donations. Correct. So Hunger Task Force as a whole has about 55 staff, but we are um, greatly assisted by almost 12,000 community volunteers during the calendar year. So at the farm, we have volunteer opportunities that start in May and go through October, and we're there six days a week. And we have two shifts a day that volunteers can help out with. And volunteers do just about everything from seeding and planting to weeding and crop maintenance. And then this time of year, a lot of our focus is on harvest. Um, and like you mentioned, we also have vo indoor vol op volunteer opportunities across agencies to help to help us sort through all the food that comes in through donations and also prepare food for distribution, so, so helping us package it and get it um, ready to go on a truck. So there's lots of ways people can get involved. Um, and we also have a number of signature um, programs that happen throughout the year. Uh, for example, this weekend is Irish Fest down at the um, festival grounds, um, and so we have volunteers that are helping us collect donated food as people are entering the fest grounds. Um, there's a, you know, you get a couple bucks off here, or you can get them free if you per, uh, donate um, canned goods at the entrance. So that's just one of many, uh, many ways that volunteers can get involved and people can share their time rather than their money. So the, the question I have is, is all the food that you're donating to the food banks locally based, or if, if Hunger Task Force sees that there is a shortage of a certain type of vegetable and or canned good, do you source that n from outside the area, or do you put out a, an alert to say, hey, can we get donations of this particular item in order to fill our quota, I guess would be a word for these food banks for people who need it? Sure. So we do have um, we have uh, we keep close a close eye on our inventory of of non perishable items, and we do our best to project what our fresh produce supply is. Of course, weather can <laughs> throw off some of those projections, but we do do targeted um, asks. So a good example is in the early part of the year, we always have a food drive that's all over the city where we're asking for peanut butter. Um, because it's a good source of protein, it's shelf stable, you can eat it even if all you have is a spoon. So we do targeted, um, drives like that, and we can forecast if we're gonna run short of it, something, and we can ask, um, for that item specifically. Um, and a big initiative that we've started in the last couple of years is the Hunger Task Force My Plate, which is trying to change the way that we think about donating food so that we're receiving healthy food donations. And as, as part of our role of that program, um, the educational piece has been to focus on one food item a month that we ask people that want to host a food drive to focus on so that we can continue the education of um, healthy, you know, making sure the healthy, the, you're making the healthiest donation possible when you're donating to a drive or to directly to the food bank. Right, because you're not looking for bags of potato chips or other junk food, let's say, uh, because your goal is to provide the healthiest food possible to people who need it. Right. And and we want to provide things that people can build a a meal with and, you know, something more than, than a snack or a temporarily, t something to temporarily fill an empty stomach. Fantastic. Um, now, obviously, people can, they can donate money instead of food or their time as well? Correct. And the, the best way to go about doing either one of those things is to visit our website, hungertaskforce.org, and there's links to how to, um, how to sign up and register to be, a to be a volunteer to learn more about the volunteer activities that exist, and then there are direct links on how to um, 
gives money as well. And, and then since it is an organization, those donations of, of, of money would be a tax-deductible uh, thing, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. And, and it will stay locally because Hunger Task Force is a locally operated organization. We're an independent organization, so we're um, really true to our roots of serving Milwaukee to our best ability. Yeah, Milwaukee is unique to have the Hunger Task Force. Is there other cities that have like a similar type of program, or is this like a one-in-a-million type of organization <laughs> that we're fortunate enough to have here in Milwaukee? Um, the farm is, well, there are a few things that make Hunger Task Force very unique. One is that we're free. Most food banks are charging for some portion of their services. Um, that's how they cover their operating expenses. But we do all of our distribution, and all the food is given for free. That makes us very pretty unique. There are not many food banks that do that. And then the size and scale of our farm and our produce production is also extremely unique. There are not many food banks out there that run a farm. Um, there are quite a few that have um, community gardens or have maybe a network of community gardeners that support them and provide donations of fresh produce. But I don't know of any that um, are running a 200-acre farm like the Hunger Task Force is. So Milwaukee is very unique that we have this. Um, organization in our own community. That's fantastic. Now, can people, um, do they have to go to a particular food bank or can they just come directly to the Hunger Task Force location to pick up food? The best thing somebody can do is to call 211. It's a hotline that can help them. Uh, or, or the person who answers the phone will find the site, the service site that's closest to them. Um, so that way they don't have to travel way across town um, in a time of need. So that that's the best thing somebody can do is dial 211 to get the closest location to where they are. Well, we, Amy, we greatly appreciate it. To, to, for people to find out more information about the donation of food, time, finances, or to find a location, uh, what is the website, again, in which we can all venture over to? It's hungertaskforce.org. Well, Amy, thank you so much for enlightening us and our listeners. Some may have never even known existed the the, the, uh, the the largeness of what Hunger Task Force is in the city of Milwaukee. You're welcome. I hope to see some of those faces at the farm soon. Absolutely. And when we come back, your garden questions and our garden answers right after this. If you have a gardening question, now is the time to call in on the IVOrganics.com 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline at 414-444-5250. Hostels wants to help you grow your own food, from seed starting supplies, hand tools, drip irrigation, harvesting equipment, and a complete line of all-natural pest control solutions. They've got you covered. Keep your garden weed-free with their time-tested, American-made wheel hose that are built to last a lifetime. And the Precision Garden Seeders have proven design for planting a wide variety of seeds. Haas Tools has what you need to get the most out of your growing space, large or small. Free shipping and outstanding customer service. Shop online or request a free catalog at HaasTools.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar, honey, or any alternative sweetener you'd like. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Available at most natural food stores and online. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants, to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Purple Cow Organics quickly and naturally increases the uptake of nutrients and water to your plants with their new bioactive vegetable supercharger designed to meet the unique needs by helping the living organisms in the soil help plants uptake the nutrients more quickly through their roots and leaves. Find out more at purplecoworganics.com. Flame Engineering, home of the Weed Dragon, the perfect propane torch kit for home and garden use. For killing weeds, no need to pull or spray. 100 other uses. Find out more at flameengineering.com. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. 
We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Haas Tools, Tree Diaper, Root Maker, Seeding Square, Rebel Green, Dripping Springs Oil, Zaz Products, Shield and Seal, Pomona Universal Pectin. Find all sponsors at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Kelly Baird. If you got a question, you can call in to the Ivy Organic 301 Plant Guard Hotline at 414-444-5250. Ivy Organic Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn. Insects and rodents protects newly installed plants and trees. Shield prudent damage surfaces for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrub. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. And we had a question we had, come in. We had several questions, and you can send mm-hmm. questions in via phone here during the show. You can also uh, email it at twvgshow at gmail.com. We had a, yeah, we had a number of questions come in this week. One is, when do you know that your garlic is cured? Let's talk about the curing process of garlic. Sure. Here. So when we harvest garlic, we we don't. You can use it right away, but for storage, which is called green garlic. Green right? garlic. Okay. Yeah, but for storage purposes and for yeah, just for storage purposes and, and whatnot, keep it from molding. Uh, keep yeah. it from molding. You cure it. You cure it simply by you can hang it up, keep it upright, and it takes about three to four weeks, sometimes up to six weeks. Um, you'll know it's ready because it'll get like real papery on the outside. It'll look like the store bought garlic. Uh, then you trim the top portions off. We want to hang it vertically. Or yeah, you set want to hang it vertically. It, yeah, set it vertically, hang it vertically in an area that has good air circulation. Again, you're trying to prevent mold, so just right. think about that. And you're setting, you just don't want to lay down because gravity will pull some of those juices and, and, and flavors into the bulb as the, as the garlic cures. Then you can trim the roots back and trim the stalk off and you can store it in a... But I would say I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't try to rush this process. No, Give it at least no, a month. No, right. And then, and then take a look. Well, how do we store our garlic since we're talking about sure, this so, so we you, have proper... You, just would, you would cut off the top and the roots and then you would just store it in a cool, dry place. Preferably out of the out opportunity of sunlight, sunlight mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, in a back of a cabinet or in a box. You don't want to put this in a plastic sack. No, like, an, like a basket. Because then you have a bag of soggy, moldy garlic mm, and yeah. yeah paper bag yeah, like okay. a, a, ba- a paper bag basket something like that something that has some air right uh, and, mm-hmm. and you want to use it in about nine months cause, at most yeah, yeah our hard neck garlic uh, eight nine months is about the lifespan we've got some to last a little longer but and you're greatly and if you if you're going to plant more mm-hmm. before you start to um before you start to eat it you want to take the the largest bulbs so that you can use those to plant more right uh, another question we had was, when do I know when it's time to harvest my watermelon? That is, that, that is one of the most frustrating things for many gardeners. They see the watermelon, and they just go ahead and harvest it. And the red, and it's supposed to be a red watermelon, and inside it's white or pink because it's not ready yet. So, what is the telltale signs that is a good indication that your watermelon is ready to be picked? So, your watermelon should have this off, this curly off growth. Um, on the stock, three, around to four, the, three to four inches away from the in, the where it in, in is connected to the actual melon. Right, and it's called a tendril. Mm-hmm. Um, and so once that turns brown, that means your watermelon is is ready to harvest. Uh, and it, you may not have that anymore because it ha- it will dry up and fall off. If it's still green and curly, your watermelon's not ready. Uh, if it has, if it's drying up and falling off, or you can look it up on online and find out what this image or what this tendril yeah. looks like, and then you can go that route. But uh, that is a good indication that you know it's ready to harvest. Uh, to, to to do that. Another question is, wh- I have I have noticed very few bees in my garden. What's going on? Well, join the club. We've all noticed this a lack yeah, of definitely. bees. Um, I don't know if there's an answer for that. There, you create, uh, grow a lot of flowers. Yeah, grow a lot of flowers. Vibrant, co- vibrant colors because they are attracted by vibrant colors, and then you know provide a habitat. Find out what a bee's habitat is, 
uh, and find out what you need to do in order to create that in your garden next year. Uh, and, and it's not, I mean, bees are an important aspect of pollination, but uh, wasp, uh, sweat bees, um, all kinds of insects help pollinate your crops in which are needed to pollinate. So, it, yeah, bees are the number one, but there's dozens of other smaller insects that uh, will help pollinate these crops. So you want to look at uh, insects that pollinate crops. Find out where you're at, what you might have, and what you need to do in order to um, get those in your garden for a better garden next year. All right, we've noticed in our garden, and we've uh, been notified, and I've noticed in other people's gardens, that our tomatoes this year, at least here in the Milwaukee area, seem to be ripening slower than maybe what we're used to. Now, Luke from MI Gardener, sponsor, seed sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show website and video productions, he did a video this week, and he pointed out, and it makes sense to me, the number one reason why your tomato plants are not ripening as quickly as you might think they should. And that's simply because the tomato are, is, are not getting enough sunlight. And this can be because there's a lot of foliage on the plant. So what you want to do is you want to go in to the plant and you want to remove the foliage. Be careful not to cut growth tips that are producing more flowers, which will soon be more tomatoes. But expose some of the areas in which the tomatoes are clustered together. You don't want to remove no more than 25, 30% top of the foliage. Again, we've talked about this on the program. We want to keep the bottom six to eight inches just soil up the stalk clean so that the soil doesn't splash up on the plant and have other uh, diseased problems such as early blight and other uh, bacterial problems. So we want to do that. But that exposes the tomato to more sun and actually allows it to ripen quicker. We also uh, want to keep the soil moist, allow the plant to have enough uptake, so we uh, moisture in the soil so we do not have to have blossom in rot. That's the blossom uh, bottom of the tomato getting black and rotten. So that's uh, one way to increase the speed in which your tomatoes ripen. Shari writes in and asks, when is the right time to harvest potatoes? Well, when the potatoes have flowered, you can harvest them at the time right after the flowers have, have, have uh, developed and, and bloomed and start to die back. We choose to wait until the plant is de- dead or has died back eh, 50%. You think it's a disease problem, but it's really not. It's the plant's life cycle. It produces the tubers. It has green growth. It flowers, and then the flowers die off, and the plant decreases and dies, and then you harvest them. Uh, we want to harvest them. We don't want to leave them in the ground for a long, long time after the plant has completely died because the potato can rot, and obviously critters and rodents can get in there and start eating those potatoes in which... We are trying to uh, get for ourselves. Uh, most potatoes, based on your early, your mid, or your late, between 70 and 135 days. That's, a, that's the range of potatoes when to harvest. You can harvest them smaller. Those are called baby potatoes, but other than that, you're, you're good to go. Another uh, good question there. When is a good time to plant radishes? Will radishes take 30 days to reach maturity? I would wait until first or second week in September, and that will give you a harvest through uh, about the middle portions of October, right when the temperatures begin to get cold. Well, that will wrap up the show, completion of our 60th program that we've been here on WNOV 860 AM and FM 106.5 in the city of Milwaukee. We greatly appreciate you joining us on the program. Some of you have been with us for all 60 shows, and today, if might be your first day, Thank you for joining us as well. You can capture all of those. You can replay all of them, revisit all of them on our website at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Under the radio tab, you can get full-length in-studio videos of each and every show, as well as podcasts in its entirety. You can find the highlights of all those programs under the highlight tab on the main page, specific interview, individual topic. You can certainly do that as well. A programming note, you can join us next week for our 61st show. Uh, we're going to be talking about growing garlic, planting it in the fall, harvesting it in the spring, uh, planting some fall garlic, as well as dealing with powdery mildew. Our guest, Dr. Lee Reich, who has mastered the art of weedless gardening without chemicals. He is also a former plant and soil researcher 
for the United States Department of Agriculture. So that would be a good conversation to have with him. As always, your garden questions. Well, until next time, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. You've been listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Tell a friend and join Joey and Holly again next week so we can all grow together. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com in association with WI Garden Media Broadcast, live from the WNOV 860 AM and the W293CX 106.5 FM. Courier Communications Studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin.